Hi grade 11s, so in this video I'm going to go through the memo for your chemistry July exam. Um, I'd like you to quickly read through the instructions before you start because some of you don't bother to read them. So please make sure that you leave a line open between every question and sub question. The advantage of doing that is if you guys make a mistake or you need to add in a bit of extra information, maybe after you've finished writing your exam and then you want to go back and write some extra information, uh, if you've left a line open you've got the space to do that. When we're marking your exam and we want to provide a little bit of feedback or explain why you did something wrong or say well done or anything like that, it gives us the space to do that. Whereas if you fill up your whole page with writing, then we don't have the space to do that. Please also write down the whole question number. So don't just write, for example, question two and then go dot two, dot three. Please write down the full question number so that we know which question it is that you're trying to answer. Use the total marks as an indication. Um, please make sure you don't just write there's a five mark question obviously it's not going to be one line please be concise don't write lines and lines and lines of information you often will struggle to finish your exam if you don't write concise answers for the explanation type questions um, two decimal answers and scientific notation with units of course so in your intermediate answers you can work to three decimal places final answer give two decimal places and always don't forget units that's something else that you can add to your total of um, when you work out how many marks you lost due to definition silly mistakes and not putting in the correct unit and not converting as well is another well converting is like a silly mistake if you forget to convert to the correct units see how many marks you lost just from that All right so question one multiple choice um, this was a question on solubility given a table of compounds solubility refers to how much of a substance you can dissolve in a liquid which one is most likely to be an ionic compound so ionic compounds metal bonded to non-metal uh, they will have very high melting points and the reason why is due to the strong intermolecular forces so high melting point you know, have strong intermolecular forces and that's that's true of many of the of, of ionic compounds and it's due to the many intermolecular forces in the ionic crystal lattice so I actually want to show you an ionic crystal lattice. So this is for sodium chloride. Note how many intermolecular forces there are here. So that's what causes ionic compounds to have very high melting or boiling points. It's due to the many intermolecular forces in the lattice. So there's a picture of the sodium chloride crystal lattice. You have seen that already. All right. Um, so of these, obviously A and B have got very low melting points. So those are not going to be your answer. So we're looking at C and D. So C has got a much higher melting point. But something else that you need to also understand with this question is that ionic compounds, for example, sodium chloride, um, there's another one, magnesium bromide in a later question that's ionic, those dissolve in water. Whereas option C, whatever compound that is, doesn't dissolve in water. So no grams of that compound will dissolve in water. So that's why option C isn't an option. Whereas option D has got also quite a high melting point, 681 degrees, and it's got a high solubility, so it dissolves easily in water. Option D is your answer there. Okay, 1.2, got a table of flammable fuels. You've got methane, hexane, octane, and carbon-18 with H38. The increasing melting point as you're moving down the table is due to... So hydrogen bonds, remember hydrogen bonds is hydrogen bonded to... Uh, a small electronegative element, so nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, so HN, HF, HO, for example. Um, none of these are feature in this table, so it's not A because it's not hydrogen bonding. Even though the compounds do contain hydrogen, it must be hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, hydrogen box bonded to oxygen, or hydrogen bonded to fluorine. Okay, so it's not A. B, the increased ionic nature of the compounds. Also not that. These are all covalent compounds. Remember, ionic metal bonded to non-metal. These are all non-metal. So those are all covalent compounds. The increase in intermolecular force strength between the molecules. Yes. So I just want to have a look at what the alkanes look like. You're going to be doing this in matric. Um, as the carbon chain gets longer and longer, there's more sites for interaction between the molecules. So between the two, between the hydrogens um, of each molecule, as the chain gets longer and longer, so as you add more and more carbons and hydrogens, then there's more sites of interaction 
for the intermolecular forces, the forces between the molecules, to occur. So option C is right. Option D, though, the increase in the molecular masses? No, it's not as a result of the masses. It's because there's more sites um, for intermolecular forces to occur. If there's more sites, then the intermolecular forces will be stronger because there's more of them between the molecules. So that's why the others aren't right. Question 1.3, calculation question. You had to work out how many molecules there are in 57.75 grams hydrogen chloride. So this is actually a grade 10 level question. The grade you could have done this last year already. Use a number of moles equals mass over molecular weight. The mass was given 54.75 over the molecular weight of hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen's got a atomic relative atomic mass of 1 and chlorine 35.5. And that gives us 1.542 moles. Okay, so we've got 1.542 moles of hydrogen chloride. Okay, the question asked how many molecules we've got. So now you need to take that and multiply it by Avogadro's number. So 1.542 times 6.02 times 10 to the 22. 23, I mean, sorry, 23. Gives us 9,28 molecules. Closest answer, just because of rounding, that's why it's slightly different, is answer B. If the question asked how many atoms there are, then you'd have to take that 9.28 molecules and multiply it by the number of atoms in HCl. So in HCl there are two atoms, hydrogen and chlorine. So each molecule's got two atoms. So if they asked you how many atoms, then you take that answer and multiply it by two. Okay. Okay, question 1.4. Got a reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to make water. Um, six moles of hydrogen and four moles of oxygen are placed into the reaction vessel and allowed to react completely. So, you need to do a bit of stoichiometry here for this. So, if you're balancing numbers, check the equation is balanced. Yes, it is. So, our balancing numbers are 2, 1, 2. 2 is to 1, reacts to form, it can have a colon, um, 2 moles of water. Okay. If they tell us that we add 6 moles of hydrogen to the reaction vessel, 6 moles of hydrogen, um, we're going to get divide up, so 6 divided by 2 is 3, and multiply across, so 6 divided by 2 is 3, 3 times 1 is 3. So you would need to have 3 moles of oxygen to react with that 6 moles of hydrogen. Oxygen, hydrogen, and water. Um, take the 6, divide up. So 6 divided by 2 is 3, and multiply across to get the water. So 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 times 2 will give us 6 moles of water. Or because it's a 2 is to 2 ratio, you're going to have 6 is to 6. Okay, so that's if we had um, 6 moles of hydrogen. If you had 6 moles of hydrogen, you would only need 3 moles of oxygen. How many moles of oxygen have you got? Well, you've actually got 4 moles of oxygen. 4 moles of oxygen. So you've got more than enough oxygen. What that means then is that oxygen is in excess. And if you've got 6 moles of hydrogen and you only need 3, that means then that the hydrogen is the reagent that's going to be your limiting reagent. Just to show that you that again, if you've got 6 moles of hydrogen, go 6 divided by 2 is 3, and 3, if you multiply across, will give us an answer of 3. So if you've got 6 moles of hydrogen, you'll need 3 moles of oxygen. How many moles of oxygen have you got? 4. So that's why, because you've got more than enough oxygen, oxygen's in excess. So that, that will allow you already to eliminate two options from this table. So if hydrogen is the limiting reagent, option A is not going to be an option, and C is not going to be an option. So now we've got option B and option D. The number of moles of water produced from oxygen being the limiting reagent. How much water can you make from this? Well, there's your answer. Six. 
six moles of water will be produced. So option D is the correct option for question 1.4. Okay, I've got Captain Jack gets arrested for stealing gold. He needs to make the zinc coin disappear. He places the coin into a beaker containing 40 mils of 0 0.1 moles per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid at a temperature of 25 degrees. So there's our temperature, there's a volume, and there's a concentration. Which of the following factors will not, please, when, you are, when you've got your reading time and you're reading your exam, and then when you're actually answering the questions, please make sure that you take particular attention to bold or italicized words. So which of the following factors will not increase the initial rate of the reaction? And also asking about rate. I asked you about rate. Not the amount of product produced, the rate, how quickly the reaction happens. All right, so increasing the temperature of the acid to 55 degrees, that will increase the rate. Remember the question asked, which will not increase the rate? So A is not an option. Breaking up the zinc coin into smaller pieces. So increasing the surface area will increase the rate. I didn't ask which would increase the rate. I asked you which will not increase the rate. So option B is not an option. Um, option D, using half as much but more concentrated hydrochloric acid. More concentrated will mean more concentrated will mean that you're going to have an increased rate. The reaction is going to happen faster. So option C is not an option. So hopefully, oh sorry, option D is not an option. So hopefully C is the right answer. Let's read. So we've got more volume, 80 centimeters cubed, of the same concentration. That's the same concentration that you had. We haven't changed the, same, the concentration. And the temperature remains the same as well. So if the concentration is the same, temperature is the same, the rate will not increase. You might get more depending on which is the limiting reagent because you've got more acid. I didn't ask you which will give you more. I asked you which will not increase the rate. So option C then is the right answer. So because the concentration and temperature are the same, rate will be the same. Question 1.6. Um, Goddess Calypso thought it would be, is a witch. Um, she's making hydrogen iodide. And I gave you the chemical reaction and Kc. Remember, the Kc value as given is for the forward reaction. Then I ask you if the volume of the container is halved, the equi calculate the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction. Okay, So if I'm asking for the reverse reaction, that would be what I've shown in red there. To get the reverse reaction, it's just the inverse of Kc. So 1 over Kc. So 1 over 45... 0.9 gives us 0 0.0218. There we go, answer D. Easy one. Question 1.7, consider the exothermic reaction below. So we've got a chemical reaction, gives out heat, um, and it question asks, come back question. Increasing the temperature of the reaction will increase the rate because why? The reaction is exothermic. No, that won't, that won't um, increase the rate of the reaction. The gaseous product expands on heating. No. The activation energy is lowered. Increasing the temperature won't change the activation energy. You'd have to add a catalyst to do that. So that's not true either. Um... The percentage of effective collisions increases? Yes. So if you increase the temperature, the atoms, the molecules gain more kinetic energy. They're going to move faster. So if they're moving faster, you're going to have collisions that are going to occur more frequently, so more often. Um, if they're moving faster, the collisions are also going to occur with more energy. So if you've got more collisions occurring more often, then the chance of having a collision that's correct will be greater. So increased chance of... Um, of a collision and if the molecules are moving with more energy then you're going to have more collisions that have got energy that's greater than or equal to the activation energy I'll say that again collisions are going to occur more frequently so if they're occurring more often then there's more chance of a collision occurring if you've got more collisions then the chances of one occurring with correct orientation will be higher so that'll increase the rate and if you increase the temperature the molecules are going to move faster that's why they collide more as well. 
but then you're going to have more chance of a collision occurring with um, the molecules having an energy that's greater than or equal to the activation energy. So that's why option D is correct. Okay, we've got this chemical reaction. Good idea to highlight the green. Wait, that's not green. Highlight the green side. It's still not green. And the blue side. Okay, which of the following changes will not result in a more blue solution? Will not result in a more blue solution. So let's go through this. If you add water to the solution, so now you are increasing the concentration of water. If you increase the concentration of water, then that would favor the forward reaction to try and use up the water. The forward reaction leads to a more blue solution. So that would result in a more blue solution, and I asked which change would not result in a more blue solution. So A would result in a more blue solution. Okay, The removal of chloride ions The removal of chloride ions by forming a precipitate. So what I'm saying is if you decrease the concentration of the chloride ion, then which reaction would be favored? Well, again, the forward reaction is going to be favored to try and make more of the chloride. So that if you favor the forward reaction, the solution is going to turn more blue. So A is not an option, B is not an option. The addition of copper sulfate. I haven't, you never got a solubility table in your, um, in your data pack. And so you don't have enough information to determine whether there's a common ion effect going on. And if there is, which reaction would be favored? So you can't go with C. Increase in pressure on the system. For pressure changes, ask yourself how many moles of gas are on the left of the chemical reaction and how many moles of gas are on the right. There's no moles of gas on the left and there's no moles of gas on the right. So changing the pressure will not result in the solution changing color. It won't become more green, it won't become more blue. So it won't result in a more blue solution. So option D is the right answer there. For question 1.9, which of the following is a macromolecule having an extensive or giant covalent bonding structure? There's only two that we talked about, silicon dioxide and diamond. I don't see diamond here, but silicon dioxide is. So go back to your notes and look, have a look at the structure for silicon dioxide, the giant covalent structure. What type of intermolecular forces are due to the attraction between temporary or instantaneous dipoles and the induced temporary dipoles? That's the definition for London forces. Easy one as well, so kind of testing your definition. Question two. Captain Jack's signature wobbly walk is likely due to the large amount of rum in his bloodstream. Okay, so what's the difference between an intra molecular bond and an intermolecular bond. I am skipping this, but please, you would need to read that during the reading time to check whether there is any um, important information. So alcohol is a molecule that contains an OH group. The only type of alcohol that humans can safely consume is ethanol, which contains two carbons. So there's the structure of ethanol, one carbon, two carbons, with that OH group attached to it, oxygen bonded to hydrogen. Immediately, before you've even read the question, you should think carbon bonded to or hydrogen bonded to an electronegative element such as nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, you've got hydrogen bonding. So whenever you see hydrogen bonded to nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine, hydrogen bonding. Here we've got hydrogen bonded to oxygen. So immediately, before you even start thinking that about this question, you should have hydrogen bonding on your mind. All right, so the difference between um, the two Intramolecular bond is a bond that occurs between atoms within molecules. So intra is always within, inside the molecule. Whereas inter then will be between molecules. Or ions or atoms of a noble gas. Okay, so that was testing definitions. Please go get the full definition from your notes. Same applies with electronegativity, which is a measure of the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. So we've got three ethanol molecules, one, two, three. They are the same, just the bottom one's been rotated slightly. Okay. I asked you to replace the delta positive or negative, so this delta positive or negative, with either a delta plus or a delta minus to show whether the oxygen atom has got a positive or negative polarity. So oxygen, slightly negative. 
Hydrogen, slightly positive. What type of bond happens along the dashed line? Sorry, along the dotted line for question 2.3.3. So this dotted line, what type of bonding takes place between that? You've got hydrogen interacting with a small electronegative element, so hydrogen bonding. Okay, so between those two, you've got hydrogen bonding. Um, when I when I was speaking about this here, guys, sorry, this hydrogen bonding won't take place within the molecule. Hydrogen bonding is an intermolecular force. It takes place between two, two molecules. So what's happening over here, that's not hydrogen bonding, but if you had another ethanol, Okay, so if you had another ethanol, I'm drawing it back to front and getting a little bit confused as I'm drawing it back to front. So that's just a mirror image of ethanol. Oxygen, hydrogen. So between that hydrogen and oxygen, there you would get hydrogen bonding. Or if I were to turn the, the green ethanol molecule around between that hydrogen and that oxygen, if they were orientated in a specific way, then you could get hydrogen bonding. Remember, hydrogen bonding is an intermolecular force that occurs between two molecules, not within a molecule. It's not an intra. So inter would be hydrogen bonding. Okay, please don't make that mistake. All right, so between the two molecules, we've got the intermolecular force, hydrogen bonding, intermolecular forces. Um, Question 2.3.4 asks, name the specific type of interaction that occurs along the dashed line. So along the dashed line, we've got dipole-dipole, because dipole-dipole um, occurs between polar molecules. Hyd ethanol is a polar molecule. Um, I've shown you how you've got the slightly positive side with the hydrogen, and then the non-polar side. So because you've got um, polar molecules, ethanol is polar, so dipole, dipole. Dipole, dipole, you could call it dipole, dipole force, dipole, dipole interaction, or dipole, dipole intermolecular force, because it's happening between that ethanol molecule and that ethanol molecule. Just like the hydrogen bonding is happening between that ethanol molecule and that ethanol molecule. There's another type of hydrogen, or not another type of hydrogen bonding, but also between this hydrogen of that ethanol molecule and this carbon, the, this does not represent hydrogen bonding. It's because it's, you've got an interaction between a hydrogen and carbon. Hydrogen bonding is between a hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay. So between the hydrogen and oxygen of two different um, ethanol molecules, hydrogen bonding. So over there, that's hydrogen bonding. And between the hydrogen of one ethanol molecule and the carbon of another, you're going to have dipole-dipole interactions. 2.3.5 of your answers to the two previous questions, the dotted line and the dashed line, so the dotted line I said represented hydrogen bonding, the dashed line dipole-dipole, which is stronger. So you've been taught many times hydrogen bonding is the stronger. Okay, The reason why, so oxygen is the small highly electronegative element, it's going to pull the electrons towards itself, so that's why the oxygen is slightly negative and the, uh, the hydrogen is going to be slightly positive. And because of that, you've got a strong electrostatic force between the slightly negative oxygen and the slightly positive hydrogen. Slightly negative oxygen and slightly positive hydrogen. So because of the difference in charge, that extreme polarity difference, um, you can have a stronger intermolecular force with hydrogen bonding compared to the, the weaker dipole-dipole. Because the, the charge difference is not as extreme um, in the dipole-dipole. Whereas hydrogen bonding, a lot more charge difference because 
of the difference, the high electronegativity difference of the small electronegative element, oxygen. Okay, moving on. 2.4.1, um, define ionic bond. Again, please go to your notes to get these definitions, guys. I hope you didn't lose marks for it. Ionic bond, transfer of electrons, and subsequent electrostatic attraction. 2.4.2, why does 100% pure liquid ethanol not conduct electricity? In order to conduct electricity, this question was answered really badly. In order to conduct electricity, you have to have mobile ions, free ions. So ionic bonding, yes, is between a metal and a non-metal. But it's not because an ionic compound has got a metal in it that it conducts electricity. It's because an ionic compound that's got a metal ion, a positive metal cation, and a negative non-metal anion, it's because of those free mobile ions that um, the solution will conduct electricity. It's not because an ionic compound contains a metal. Please don't say that. It's also not electrons that move. It's the ions that move, and that's why ethanol can't conduct electricity because it doesn't contain any free mobile ions. Okay? Ethanol is covalent, meaning it doesn't contain, it's only got non-metals, so no mobile ions. Please don't talk about electrons. It's the mobile ions. 242, explain why adding pure water to ethanol does not help ethanol to conduct electricity. But if you add magnesium bromide, If you add magnesium bromide to the solution, then ethanol would conduct electricity. Um, so the reason why, if you add pure water, pure water is also a covalent compound. Um, also got no mobile ions to conduct electricity. So you're just adding another substance that still can't conduct electricity to the ethanol. However, if you add magnesium bromide, so the magnesium bromide is an ionic compound, that would then split into Mg2 plus and Br minus ions. Okay, And adding that... The, the magnesium bromide would, um, the word is dissociate into the Mg plus and the Br minus, and those are mobile ions. So that would allow the solution to conduct electricity. The magnesium bromide ethanol solution would then conduct electricity. Lewis diagrams, that was what we taught you last year already. So magnesium's got two valence electrons, bromine has got seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you needed to know that the formula for magnesium bromide was MgBr2. Show the transfer of electrons. Okay, very important to do that. That's then going to give us magnesium with a charge of 2 plus because it's lost two electrons. Electrons will be donated, transferred, rather transferred from magnesium to the bromine. So we've got magnesium. Use square brackets to show that the 2 plus charge is distributed all around the magnesium ion. And you're also going to have 2 bromine. You have 2 bromine anions with a charge of minus 1. If I did it in colors, there's magnesium's green electrons. Okay, so the 2 just represents that you've got 2 of whatever's inside the bracket. So there's your 1 bromine, there's the other. And that's why I've written a 2 over there, because you've got 2 of them. Okay, 3 marks. This is grade 10 work. In 2.5, consider the structure of ethanol and ethane. Okay, so in ethanol we said that it was polar because the hydrogen is slightly positive. Um, ethanol, there's hydrogen bonding if you've got, if you look at the bonding between two different ethan, ethanol molecules. However, for um, ethane, in ethane, ethane is a nonpolar substance, so it doesn't have a pole. So, nonpolar, therefore, we've got London forces. Remember, London forces take place between nonpolar molecules and the noble gases, or well, noble gases are nonpolar. Okay, 2.5.1, identify the intermolecular forces present in ethane. Well, there you go, London forces. Okay, 252, by referring to the relative strength of the intermolecular forces present in ethane and ethanol, explain which you'd expect to have the higher boiling point. So for higher boiling point, you need to talk about what's going to have the strongest intermolecular forces. So hydrogen bonding 
um, which takes place between two ethanol molecules. Hydrogen bonding um, which has got stronger intermolecular forces. If you've got stronger intermolecular forces, then higher boiling point. Whereas ethane, uh, the London forces are weaker, so weaker intermolecular forces, lower boiling point. A lot of you said incorrectly that ethanol is dipole-dipole and not hydrogen bonding. Okay, so but ethanol does have um, dipole-dipole, sure, but it's also got hydrogen bonding. And of course, the stronger hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces taking place, those are stronger. So you look at the strongest ones. In order to boil ethanol, you need more energy to overcome ethanol's stronger intermolecular forces, the stronger intermolecular forces being hydrogen bonding. Whereas for ethane, you don't need as much energy because the intermolecular forces, the um, London forces between eth two ethane molecules, or between ethane molecules, not just two, obviously not looking at two molecules, you're looking at gazillions of them, but the energy required to overcome the weaker London forces in an ethane molecule or in ethane molecules between ethane molecules is less than hydrogen bonding in ethanol. Explain why ethane would not dissolve in water but ethanol would. So with polarity or with, with dissolving you need to consider whether substances have got the same polarity or not. So like dissolves in like meaning polar substances will dissolve in other polar liquids. A polar liquid will dissolve in a polar liquid. And a non-polar liquid dis would dissolve or be miscible, dissolve in, mix with another non-polar liquid. So water is a polar liquid, polar molecule. Okay, so water is polar. Um, ethanol is polar. And that's why ethanol and water will mix. Or um, ethanol would mix with uh, water. Whereas ethane is non-polar. Ethane is nonpolar, and so nonpolar ethane would not mix with polar water. Um, please don't talk about. So this is something that a lot, a lot of people did incorrectly. Don't talk about the fact that, or don't talk about ethanol um, being split apart by the water molecules. What you're thinking of there is the sodium chloride lattice being pulled apart by the water molecules. So that happens with ionic compounds. So over here, this sodium chloride lattice, that would be um, pulled apart by water molecules. And that's what you're thinking of. Please don't get confused between them. All right, Jack finds the following substances in a sealed container on the shelf next to ethanol. So at Sahiti, we like asking questions like this. Those of you who have done many past papers, I'm sure that you would have come across questions um, very similar to this one. So identify which substance has hydrogen bonding into molecular forces. So between two molecules, um, the molecules must have hydrogen bonded to a small electronegative element like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So that takes place then with NH3, nitrogen bonded to hydrogen. C of delocalized electrons. Um, for delocalized electrons, we're talking about metallic bonding. So if you're talking about metallic bonding, you need to find a metal. So potassium is the metal that you're going to have there. Which substance can conduct electricity only when molten? So it's the ionic substances. For example, sodium chloride that I've shown you so many times already. Sodium chloride conducts electricity when it's molten, and that's because the substance, the intermolecular forces are overcome when you melt it. So all of these intermolecular forces that you see in the crystal lattice are overcome when you melt the substance, and then you get separate sodium plus cations and Cl minus chloride anions. And it's those free mobile ions that conduct electricity. So you're looking for a ionic compound, an ionic compound that will conduct electricity when in molten. So the ionic compound that you've got there is potassium iodide. This um, magnesium bromide from earlier, that would also conduct electricity when it's molten because it's an ionic compound. Which substance has got London forces between molecules? So London forces between nonpolar uh, molecules or molecules of noble gas. So what's nonpolar? Well, iodine. Here's the Cooper structure for iodine. Here's the Cooper structure for carbon dioxide. Okay, so iodine, I2, and CO2 are both nonpolar. Okay, 
okay so either iodine or carbon dioxide you could have said for that one and the substance with the lowest boiling point so for lowest boiling point we're looking for the substance with the weakest intermolecular force which substance has got the weakest intermolecular force as well if this if jack finds these on a shelf and nitrogen and carbon dioxide are both so not nitrogen ammonia and carbon dioxide are both gases at room temperature you can already eliminate the others that are still in the solid or the liquid state okay so now it's between ammonia and carbon dioxide so which has got the if you're looking for lowest boiling point um, then it would have the weakest intermolecular force so between nitrogen in NH3 we've got hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces and I told you that those are strong hydrogen bonding is a strong intermolecular force so that then means that carbon dioxide is your answer for that so this one 2.6.5 carbon dioxide okay question three was about Captain Jack Sparrow and titanium so you were given a chemical reaction, not necessarily balanced. Um, if you checked it though, it would have been balanced. So that's something that you can do mentally during your reading time. Um, it's an exothermic reaction, so your delta H is less than zero. So that's all correct. Define a uh, titanium trichloride is a volatile liquid upon contact with human air. It forms clouds of titanium dioxide and hydrated hydrogen chloride dramatic effect so this is actually used for making smoke define molar volume so definitions again please find that in your notes one mole of gas occupies 22.4 decimeters cubed at standard temperature and pressure okay if 400 grams of titanium dioxide reacts with 400 decimeters cubed of chlorine gas At standard temperature and pressure prove that the titanium dioxide is the limiting reagent in the equation so we have to prove that titanium dioxide is the limiting reagent so you won't get a mark for saying that it's the limiting reagent because that's what you are to prove we're telling you that it is okay so let's write out the chemical equation again um, but writing down what what information you've got under each um, reagent it's so got 400 grams of the titanium dioxide. How many moles is that? Always convert to moles so that you can compare apples and apples. So N equals 2 M over MR. Mass is 400. Molecular weight for titanium dioxide. If you add up the molecular weight for titanium plus oxygen plus another oxygen, you get 80. So titanium is 48, oxygen 16. So 48 plus 16 plus 16 gives us 80. And that comes 400 divided by 80 is um, 5 moles. Please remember units. Don't forget to put your units. You will lose a mark if you don't put your units. Um, use your molar volume equation. So N equals 2 V over Vm to work out how many moles of chlorine you've got. So volume is 400. Molar volume 22.4. So that means that the number of moles of chlorine gas that are available is 17.86. So not necessarily available. That's just what, what would happen if you reacted 400 grams of titanium oxide, dioxide, 17.86. Um, okay. So 5 moles of titanium dioxide would react with 17.86 moles of chlorine gas. So if you had 5 moles of chlorine, 5 moles of um, titanium dioxide, how many moles of chlorine gas would you actually need to react if you use the stoichiometric ratios that you were given? So our stoichiometric ratio is 5. Sorry, is 1 is to 2, is to 2 is to 1 is to 2. So 1 is to 2 is to 2 for the carbon that reacts to form. 
one mole of titanium chloride, trichloride, tetra, sorry, tetra, because there's four there, tetra, titanium tetrachloride, and two moles of carbon dioxide. So one is to two is to two is to one is to two. Right, if we've got five moles of titanium dioxide, how many moles of chlorine would you need? So we're gonna divide up and multiply across. So five divided by one is five, and five times two is 10. So you then need 10 moles of chlorine gas. That would then react, sorry, combine with 10 carbons. So two is to two will give you 10 is to 10. 5 and 10. Okay, that can be your option A. Option B, if you take the 400 decimeters cubed, which is 17.86 moles of chlorine, how many moles of titanium dioxide would you then need? Let's have a look and see. Seventeen point eight six. Use your stoichiometric numbers. Let me just erase this. Okay, seventeen point eight six divide up. Seventeen point eight six divide by two times by one gives eight point nine three. And if you've got um, 2 is to 2, then you're going to have 17.86 is to 17.86. If you've got 5 is to 5, then you're going to have 8.93 is to 8.93. So that's just using stoichiometry that you have learned in your stoichiometry section. And if you've got 10 is to 10, 10 is to 10, then you will have 17.86 is to 17.86. So we're going to use this little table to help us. Um, this first row is for the TiO2. Can't read that very well. And then the second column with the 2 and the 17.86, that is for the chlorine gas. Third one's for the carbon. So that column's for the carbon. And then the fourth column is for the titanium tetrachloride. Right, so that's where all of that comes from. So now that we've got all these stoichiometric ratios, we've worked out option A is if you've got five moles of titanium dioxide, so five moles of red, you would need 10 moles of blue, 10 moles of chlorine gas. Okay, option B is then if you've got 17.86, if you've got 17.86 moles of chlorine gas, how many moles of titanium dioxide would you need? So if you've got 17.86 moles of blue, you would need to have 8.93 moles of red. Okay. Unfortunately though, if you need 8.93 moles of red of the titanium dioxide, but you've only got five, because that's what you were, we worked out of here, you've only got five, but you need 8.93 for option B, then option B is not the viable option because you only got 5 and you need 8.93. That then means that option A is the viable option. And so if option A is the viable option, then that means that the titanium dioxide is the limiting reagent. So that you'd have more than enough um, chlorine, but you would run out of titanium dioxide. 
Um, question 3.3. If the 400 decimeters cubed of titanium tetrachloride is obtained, oh, sorry, if 400 decimeters cubed of titanium tetrachloride is exp obtained experimentally, so that's our volume of titanium chloride, in the reaction when 400 grams of the titanium dioxide reacts completely, calculate the percentage yield of the reaction. So for percentage yield, percentage yield is the actual divided by the theoretical yield, actual yield over theoretical yield times by 100. Uh, if you want, you need to calculate the theoretical yield first. So you're going to go the 5 moles times the molar volume because we know that um, 400 grams of titanium dioxide produces 5 moles of it. We worked that out over there. Okay. So we've got 5 moles. You can use your molar volume formula. N equals V over Vm. Rearranged to V equals N times Vm. So we've got 5 moles times molar volume, which is 22.4. 5 times 22.4 is 112 decimeters cubed. Okay, so now percentage yield. Percentage yield actual yield over theoretical yield. I'm writing terribly like some of you guys do. Um, times by 100 to get a percent. Okay, so the actual yield is the 400 because that's what they told us we're going to get. So, wait, sorry, no, 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 I've circled the wrong thing. 400 decimeters cubed of chlorine divided by the 112 from here times by 100. And 400 divided by 112 times 100 gives us 357.14%. Now, how's that possible? Well, it's not. You can't have a chemical reaction and get more than 100%. The most that you could possibly get is 100%. So there's something not right here. Captain Jack and his monkey, something dodgy going on. So now it says, question 3.4, the percentage yield is not exactly 100%. Well, no, it's not because it's 357.14%. Captain Jack Sparrow wants to blame the monkey, Captain Barbosa. Barbosa's pet monkey called Jack the monkey. So you need to provide a more plausible reason for that calculated percentage yield. So more than likely they had an initial, they measured incorrectly, the incorrect measurement of the mass was wrong, or the 400 decimeters cubed that they collected. So this 400 decimeters cubed that they collected over here, um, that must be wrong. That could be possibly both the titanium and the carbon dioxide added together. That might be 400 uh, decimeters cubed, whereas the titanium tetrachloride must have, would have been less, for example. So those are some of the errors that they could have made. Please don't talk about the opposite. So don't say that it was there was some substance that unreacted, some remained on the inside of the reaction vessel. Those are the reasons that you give if your percentage is less than 100. So say, for example, if you get 60% uh, yield, then that's because some substance didn't react um, or some, some substance remained on the, the inside of the reaction vessel. So please, if you get an um, answer that's bigger than 100, you can't give reasons as to why it's less than 100. So don't talk about gas escaping, uh, something like that. Okay, um, 3.5.1, what's meant by collision theory? So that's the definition. Uh, Chemical reaction will only proceed when reactant particles collide effectively, so they have the correct orientation and sufficient energy, meaning kinetic energy more than or equal to activation energy. That is a definition straight from your notes. Add that to your total if you didn't get two out of two for that question. Captain Jack Sparrow wants to increase the rate of the reaction by increasing the pressure. Would he be successful? So we've spoken about this already. Um, increasing the pressure, you have to take the number of moles of gas into account. So would he be successful? Yes, and the reason why is because the gas particles, sorry, yeah, gas particles of the reactant make more frequent successful collisions with the other reactants. So yes, he would be. If you increase the pressure, you're going to have, um, you could do that by decreasing the volume, for example. If you've then got the same amount of particles in less volume, they're going to collide more often. 
if they collide more often, you're going to get a faster rate. So yes, you would be successful. Explain why increasing the concentration of titanium dioxide would not change the rate. So titanium dioxide is a solid, and you cannot change the concentration of a solid. Okay. Question 3.6.1 and 3.6.2, those are definitions. Um, straight from your notes, activated complex is a high energy unstable temporary transition state between the reactants of the products. Add that to your total if you didn't get one out of one for it. And 3.6.2, heat of reaction or change in enthalpy is the net change in chemical potential energy of the system. So explain why an exothermic reaction has a negative enthalpy value. So why is delta H less than zero? It's because energy, more energy is released than was taken in by the system. Or um, the system transforms chemical potential energy into heat or thermal energy. So you're going to have a negative change in enthalpy. And that might make a little bit more sense if you, if you bear the graph in mind. And the next question asks you to draw a fully labeled energy profile graph for this reaction. Some of you drew weird graphs, some of you did the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, some of you did the, the rates graph. You did all sorts of weird things and I'm not sure why. So the graph that you had to do um, was the one straight from your notes. So label your axes, so energy measured in joules, reaction coordinate, I'm abbreviating, you should not. So this is the energy of your reactants, this is your energy of your products. So to go from the energy of your reactants to the energy of your products, um, that would be your change in enthalpy. Change in enthalpy. And it's gone from, if you start off with your reactants to your products, it's gone down. And that's why delta H is less than zero. Whenever you've got a delta, it's final minus initial. So this would be a smaller value minus a bigger value, and a small minus a big will give you a negative answer. So that's why delta H was less than zero for this um, exothermic chemical reaction. Okay, so what happens in between? Well, you have to get to the activated complex. So at the top here, that's when you get to the activated complex. And if you've got successful collisions, meaning the particles have got correct orientation and kinetic energy more than or equal to the activation energy. So whatever this value is here, that would be your activation energy. Um, the difference between the energy of the reactants and the activated complex, that is activation energy. If they've got more than that amount of energy, more than that amount of energy, then they will continue and the reaction will take place and then it'll proceed to give you products. So please label that um, activation energy is what I'm going to show you in green. That is EA. Okay, and that's for the uncatalyzed reaction. At the top here, that peak is the activated complex. Okay, label, tell me that EA is activation energy. Activation energy, you need to write this out. Okay, um, label reactants and products. Energy of the reactants and products. And I've labeled delta H in blue already. Okay. Then 3.6.5 asks you to show what it would look like if you had a catalyst. So adding a catalyst, a catalyst works by lowering the activation energy. So let me do that in purple. So the purple dashed line, that represents... I've run out of space here, but I'll put a star there and say that that is EA, which means activation energy with a catalyst. Or for the catalyzed reaction. So 
but what I've done and how I've set this out is really not how to set it out. Um, in your notes, there is a memo, or sorry, uploaded to Teams, there is a memo, which I don't have on my iPad, but please just have a look at the neater version in the memo. And how to better set, a, set out your work. Um, but same graph, same labels, just uh, set out a little bit more neatly. 3.7, Jack still wants his precious titanium, so he uses the titanium tetrachloride produced by the previous reaction to synthesize titanium as shown in the reaction below. You should realize it's not balanced. 3.7.1 asks you to balance the chemical reaction. So the balancing numbers are going to be 2. You don't have to do anything there, but it would be 1. 2, 1, 2, 1. Explain the difference between percentage yield and percentage purity. So percentage yield, if you expect to get 100 grams and you only get 90 grams, then you get a 90% yield. Okay, that is percentage yield. And, it, and, and think of the formula when, you, when you're stating that. So percentage yield is the actual yield, what you actually get, over what you calculate, what you get theoretically, times 100. Whereas percentage purity, that is how pure the sample is. So please also be careful in the memo. It's actually the wrong way around in the memo. Percentage purity is the mass of the pure compound out of the mass of the impure. So if I gave you... What's a little example of this? If I gave... If we talk about gold, for example, if you had pure gold that had a mass of 100 grams, so if you had a sample of gold, to say, say a golden ring that had a mass of 100 grams, sure, that's a lot of gold. But actually of that ring, only 40% is pure gold. Then the percentage purity would be 40 divided by 100, which is 40%. So that's the difference between percentage yield and percentage purity, related to the formula as well. So percentage purity, um, mass of pure compound over mass of impure compound times 100. And for percentage yield. Percentage yield is actual yield over theoretical yield times 100. So Jack finds some magnesium ribbon that's got a mass of 600 grams laying around. Sure, sort of lucky Jack. Um, so that's the mass of the sample. Note that it's not all, not everything in the 600 gram sample is magnesium ribbon. It's been left out in the air and so some of it is oxidized. So it's formed magnesium oxide. If Jack is able to produce 10.42 moles of titanium, let me highlight this in colors to help you see, so 10.42 grams of titanium from that impure magnesium sample, how much, calculate the percentage purity of the suspicious magnesium sample. So how pure was that sample if he managed to get 10.42 moles of titanium out of it? So look at the stoichiometric numbers. We've got 2 is to 1. For magnesium is to titanium. So from that chemical reaction we've got 2 is to 1. So for magnesium to titanium is a 2 is to 1 ratio. Okay. They tell us that he gets 10.42 moles of titanium. Okay, 10.42 moles. Using stoichiometry, divide up. So 10.42 divided by 1 is 10.42. Multiply across, and that gives you 20. Point, I'll do it in a different color. Um, 20.84. And that's moles of magnesium. 20.84 moles of magnesium. Some of you tried to calculate the number of moles of titanium or calculate the number of moles of magnesium. You didn't need to. You were told you had 10.42 moles of titanium was obtained from that chemical reaction from the magnesium sample. So not all of it was pure. 20.84 uh, moles of magnesium was obtained. The theoretical mass of magnesium. Let's calculate that. So now we've calculated the number of moles, or not calculated, but we've used stoichiometry to get the number of moles of magnesium. I'm going to write the moles so that you know it's not grams. Moles of magnesium is what that 20.84 is, 20.84 moles of magnesium. Okay, 
Now let's calculate how much you would have expected to have gotten and compare it. So the sample weighs 600 grams. How much should, should you have actually got? You would have got a little bit less because it's an impure sample. So N equals to M over MR. I need to do this in red. Um, the number of moles is 20.84. Let's see how much that would have weighed. Mass of magnesium is 24.3. So the mass of magnesium then is 20.84 times 24.3. That gives us 506.41. Grams of magnesium. So 20.84 moles represents 506.41 grams. The sample, however, was 600 grams. So that allows us to calculate the percentage purity of the sample. So percentage purity I told you was mass of pure compound. Please make a note that the memo says mass of impure compound as the numerator, and that's not correct. And times 100 to get a percent. Note pure divided by impure. Pure divided by impure. In the memo, it's the other way around, which is wrong. Okay, so that's the formula for percentage purity. So the mass of the pure compound is 506.41. The impure sample that found Jack laying that Jack found laying around is 600 grams, which gives a percentage purity of 84.4%. Two decimal places, please. So percentage purity equals to 84.4%. And please just make a note of that error that I pointed out in the memo. So of a sample, the sample was 600 grams. Of it, 20.84 moles was pure magnesium. 20.84 moles, you use N equals N over MR to calculate that it's actually 506.41 grams. So percentage purity is 506 out of the 600 which gives 84%.